We meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So we are here today with Aaron Burns, who's the executive director of Carbon 180. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Michelle. Absolutely. So on Energy Impact, we like to highlight the work that's being done to make clean energy and climate abatement projects actually implemented around the world. And with decarbonization, that's really the ultimate goal. Um, and something that Carbon 180 clearly focuses on is paving the way for carbon removal. And they focus on areas to do this around policy, around the private sector and business innovation, and of course, around accelerated research. So we're gonna get into all of those amazing areas where Erin and her organization have been focusing for the past several years. But I would love to actually start by getting to know you and introducing you to our audience, Erin. So if you could just kind of start with your background and, and how you really became personally involved in climate policy to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, I did not plan on working on climate policy or carbon management. Um, I actually have a degree in cultural anthropology, um, but I'm from Southern West Virginia. And when I graduated college and was thinking about what my next steps were, I sort of moved to DC on a whim. I don't think I'd actually been here before I moved here and um, was thinking about the kind of thing that I wanted to do. And um, I'm from Southern West Virginia and was thinking about, uh, you know, as I had left the state and from the outside of a town of about 4,000 people, um, you know, how much impact that it had on me as a person and, and sort of my perspective on the world and ended up uh, uh, getting a job in the office of Senator Joe Manchin mm -hmm. and working on energy and labor policy as well as some other public lands issues, a couple of other things. And I was there for about four years working on these. And as part of that, got really involved in some of the carbon management work. And that's actually back in 2015, where I met Noah, our uh, one of our two co-founders and our current president. And he came in and said, you know, you guys work on point source carbon capture. You should really also think about legislation for direct air capture. And that was maybe one of the first times I'd heard about it. Um, and I uh, went around to a couple of folks I knew and trusted because I had just met Noah. And I was like, this could be, he seems legit and uh, his ideas make sense, but let me like just, you know, do a little bit of vetting. And everybody was like, yeah, he's great. And he really knows what he's talking about. This is definitely something that folks need to be aware of. And we ended up writing one of the early pieces of carbon removal legislation together. Um, and, uh, and from there, I just kind of kept working with Carbon 180. And I'll say, you know, for me being a policy person and being somebody who is not a scientist who doesn't come from the private sector, but has really spent the you know decade of my career just in the policy space. Um, I kept coming to Carbon 180 because they, you know, were the, the scientists on staff, right? They have um, you know these deep ties to innovators, these deep ties to the research community. Um, and when I was thinking about you know how do you write really great policy that is reflective of sort of what's needed from you know, what entrepreneurs or innovators need and, and really reflective of where technologies are, um, having those connections are really essential. And so I kept coming to them and coming to them and asking what was needed and working with them. And so when they were interested in starting a policy shop back in 2018, I was really excited to, to join the team. And since then, you know, we've really shifted as an organization where we still work at the center of, like you said, of the sort of business and science and policy piece, but it really shifted to focus on that federal policy impact. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, and that's something just kind of reflecting on my my own uh, foyer into uh, climate policy work and, you know, coming to carbon capture, I have a similar background, except on the science side, starting out kind of in, in carbon capture uh, systems research, um, and then eventually moving into policy. But absolutely, you know, 
a decade ago, you know, five years ago, uh, carbon removal and decarbonization and going carbon negative. These were things that were, were barely talked about. We were barely reaching consensus and reaching net zero. Um, and so, you know, having organizations like Carbon 180 that are actually speaking to real scientists who are looking at, you know, the carbon problem in our atmosphere and, and saying, you know, the problem is not the carbon we're emitting now, it's the carbon that's already there that we need to actually address. That's so critical because it might have sounded to, to someone 10 years ago like this was kind of a far-fetched idea, um, but that's where the science was 10 years ago and even before that. And it's really great that now we're finally having organizations that are focusing on ensuring that our policy goals match up with where the science actually is. So I know you aren't a scientist, but I know you are an expert on this. So I will ask you to kind of jump into actually this goal around carbon negative. Could you define that as a policy goal and why we actually need to reach carbon uh, carbon or go beyond carbon neutral, go beyond getting to net zero and actually get back to, to um, understood levels of carbon dioxide and, and actually removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? No, I'm really glad you asked that question. It's funny, I was thinking back even just three, four years ago um, where the conversations in the policy space were, is decarbonization too technical a word? Like, is that too, should we, is there a way? And I think that's in part where some of the net zero conversation came from. That's a little, you know, more obvious. And that even felt really ambitious a few years ago. And I think, yeah, for us, and I think really the vanguard of the conversation is actually net zero is really not enough. We need to be thinking about net negative and we need to be thinking about not only, so first of all, obviously, and I think, you know, this conversation is incredible. I, Maybe it'd be timely any week we had it, but um, we are seeing the impacts of climate change already, right? This is not a problem for the future. It will get worse in the future if we don't do anything, but it is happening today. Um, this is impacting people's lives right now. And so what we need to think about is one, addressing, as you mentioned, those legacy emissions. We already have too much CO2 in the atmosphere and we need to pull it out. We also, and something that's really important for us is we need to think about as we are not going to stop emitting tomorrow that we're going to keep emitting and we need to use carbon removal as a an appropriate tool um, in addressing some of those continued emissions. And I say appropriate because one of the things that is incredibly important and really central to our work is that this is an addition to really aggressive mitigation. You know, this is in some of the work that we're doing and um, Rory Jacobson on our team, who's our deputy director of policy and leads our technological carbon removal work is gonna be spending, him and his team are gonna be spending time on over the next year or so is looking at what is the appropriate role of carbon removal when we're thinking about, for example, industrial decarbonization in some of these places where it is really hard to decarbonize really quickly and is there an appropriate and what is the appropriate role for carbon removal? So again, that it's not a replacement for mitigation, um, but is sort of alongside really ambitious mitigation. Um, I also think it's really important when we're talking about the role of carbon removal and meeting climate goals, you know, Sometimes, depending on your background, that gets shortened to, you know, I come from definitely more tech policy background. You know, we do work on the full suite of carbon removal um, solutions. So we work on nature-based solutions, we work on hybrid solutions and technological solutions, and there's an appropriate role for all of those. And so I think it's also really important to look at when you're thinking about policy, how do you incentivize carbon removal really across the board? And I think that there are um, you know, the, the last thing I'll say is I think when we're thinking about policy, not only are we thinking about, again, that this is an, an addition to incredibly aggressive mitigation, that this is, um, you know, we need to be really strategic about what we're talking about when we're saying carbon removal is going to help, you know, hard to abate emissions. Um, but I think it's also a really exciting thing to work on in policy because it's, it's an area in climate policy that is pretty nonpartisan. And I think in large part, that's due to the fact that it has a bunch of co-benefits that really you can come in and, and see something that is for you, for your constituents, something for you to like about carbon removal, um, whether that's, you know, if we're thinking about soil carbon sequestration and the sort of co-benefits that come with that in addition to climate benefits, or, you know, again, being from Southern West Virginia, if I think about places in my hometown or near my hometown where you might want to think about how can you uh, use retired coal plant infrastructure uh, for direct air capture? And how do you think about those being high paying union jobs? And how do you think about using 
US made, labor made uh, US steel that is creating these sort of really robust domestic supply chain. So I also think coming in, there's an opportunity to not only do this in a way that is right for climate goals, um, but it also comes with all of these additional benefits for these communities that are, um, you know, that are going to host these projects. I think, yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with, with, with everything you said. You touched on a lot of really good points that I do want to make sure we kind of tease out um, because while you and I might be very familiar with, with carbon removal technologies and, and techniques and even the full kind of roadmap um, that, that many of these policy options are exploring and laying out, I think a lot of people, this is pretty new to them. Um, so, so let's actually kind of break it down. I think an easy framework for carbon removal strategies is to think about them as you kind of alluded to, the technical carbon removal strategies like director capture, carbon tech, and then the kind of biological, if you will, um, strategies for carbon removal, afforestation, soil carbon. And of course, these are highly technical as well areas. But if you could kind of just um, maybe use that as a framework to talk about some of the policies um, that the Carbon 180 is exploring into making sure that we have kind of a full solution set, if you will, available um, for achieving carbon removal priorities um, in the given area where it makes sense. So kind of the biological side and the technical side. Absolutely. And I think it's really important to break this down because carbon removal isn't a monolith and the policies you need to incentivize them are very different. Um, I have to go ahead and plug on our website. We have a big a big federal policy blueprint that we released earlier this year called Zero the Negative. Um, and our policy team just, uh, I just have to say again, like thinking about being a policy person and um, you know, using the ideas and, and turning the ideas of our team into bills and laws. When we started this process of drafting this roadmap, we created a spreadsheet and said, policy team, like throw in all of your policy ideas. Like, and there were more than 150 policy ideas. And um, it's just really exciting to, to work with that kind of team. It was all of these really amazing ideas. There aren't, it's not as long as that, there aren't 150 we, um, we, we cut back. But um, so, um, First of all, on the biological side, we work primarily on soil carbon sequestration and afforestation, forest management reforestation. Um, on the soil carbon side, one of the things that we think is most important is, um, and actually, let me step back. We had a report called Leading with Soil, which was the culmination of multiple years of work, working with farmers and ranchers on the ground in the Mountain West to understand their barriers to implementing practices that are going to increase carbon in soils. Mm. And we found sort of three buckets. One is around science and education. One is around um, incentives. And then, and, and I wanna dig in actually around that science and research piece of it. It's really important when we're thinking about how carbon rule is going to fit into climate goals that we're able to monitor and verify how much carbon we're pulling out of the atmosphere and storing into soils. And on that front, we think there's a really important role for the federal government to play in laying that really strong foundation of science and technical information so that we can do that work. So the incentive piece is very important, but making sure the science piece is there. And so um, you will see in, in some of our um, recommendations from the past and some things that are going to be coming out over the next few months that in the upcoming farm bill, um, through appropriations and federal funding, we think there are opportunities to really uh, jumpstart a lot of that work. Um, on the technological side, there are a few things, and you're going to learn very quickly that that, again, is my background, and so can talk about this for a very long time, but there are a couple of things. We now have a lot of incentives for director capture, but I think one of the most important things and something we're starting to see more attention on is what I kind of refer to as enabling infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Obviously, very timely conversation. But if you think about um, a direct air capture project, you have to, you know, there's a lot of focus. And I think this has been the case in point source carbon capture on it's expensive, that per ton, it costs a lot of money and we need to bring down a cost. Definitely true, right? Through innovation, we're really excited. We got the first ever dedicated carbon removal program at the Department of Energy last year authorized. We saw that reflect in the president's budget. Funding for this has been a huge priority for us. But the other piece of this is once you capture that carbon dioxide, you need to transport it and you need to do something with it. And the primary thing that's going to happen if you were talking about doing this in line with climate goals is you're gonna store it underground in saline formations. We have really great geology in the US for this. There's a huge opportunity to do that. 
But if you're a project developer, you're going to look and say, actually, that's not been done very much in the US, not because it can't be or that we don't know the science, but because the permitting process isn't particularly well funded or well resourced at EPI. And so if we start to look at the whole life, the whole life cycle of, you know, a, pro a director capture project and how you're going to get it deployed, you see that, um, you know, yes, let's invest in R&D and that's a huge priority for us. Um, but also we need to think about the role of the federal government in things like permitting these sites and developing and deploying infrastructure in ways that are really aggressive and robust, but also ways that um, have really strong community engagement and are in line with a lot of environmental justice priorities. And so a big, uh, a big thing that we're focused on is actually around those pieces of infrastructure. You know, how do you improve the, the it's called the class six permit, to, mm -hmm. if you want to pump CO2 underground, how do you how do you how do you do that really well? Um, and so I think that that's one of the primary ways that federal policymakers in the near term can really jumpstart this industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we're really lucky in the United States that we have agencies that have been operating for for decades, if not you know, hundreds of years at this point, collecting all of this base level data about our, our geology, about our our, our land. Um, uh, structures, you know, we have NASA, NOAA, USGS, you know, keep going. There's like 17 different agencies that have a role in Earth observations, um, not just in the United States, but globally. And so we have this treasure trove of data and information on our local ecosystems, on our local uh, uh, geography and, and hydrology and, and, and you name it. And so it's really important that we we take advantage of, of this level of data and then ensure that we're actually able to utilize the fact that we've mapped the majority of, of our geology in the United States um, for these types of projects. I really like that you called it enabling infrastructure and used in the infrastructure in kind of this broader term to also include permitting and to include political infrastructure or more policy infrastructure, not really political, um, because those are critically enabling pieces of this. There are, of course, enabling technologies, right? So, so you're talking about the storage component. Once you also, once you've gotten it, um, you've captured the CO2, and and you want to do permanent storage. Of course, there are private sector efforts to look at ways to actually monetize um, use or utilization of carbon dioxide. I wonder if you wanted to kind of speak on some of those efforts as well. Yeah, so we're really excited about the opportunities around what we call carbon tech, which is um, when you take that carbon dioxide and create products and goods out of it. Um, I mentioned my, uh, apparently I'm just going to talk about Rory a bunch, um, but Rory uh, helped lead a report um, a few years ago around the total available market for carbon tech goods and found that in the US alone, it's about a trillion dollars. And so there's a huge economic opportunity here. And there's a huge, you know, and I think that's important for all of the reasons we care about economic opportunity, but also because when you're thinking about the capture cost, when you're pulling that CO2 from the air, if you can then sell it to somebody who's going to create a product, that's another way to think about financing your project and to a deal with some of those really high capture costs, especially in the early stage. Um, I also think there's a really cool opportunity where um, you can think about captured CO2 is not just this way to deploy direct air capture, help the deployment of direct air capture, and this way to build markets, um, but also as a way to replace higher carbon intensity products and materials. Mm -hmm. um, something that's been getting a lot of traction is the role of CO2 embodied concrete cement um, and building materials more broadly. Huge economic opportunity and we have companies doing it today. Um, so there have been efforts in New York and California and Hawaii. Um, and there's actually um, some early federal efforts on this as well. Um, and I'll mention uh, my former colleague, Dr. Suchi Chalati, who's now Chief of Staff at the Office of Fossil Energy at the Department of Energy, um, wrote a paper at the end of last year looking at what federal policies could look like to incentivize these building materials. But it really goes beyond that, chemicals, fuels, um, you know, looking at, um, there's a company called Lands Attack and they partner with Virgin uh, Airlines and flew a plane from, I'm going to get the direction wrong, but from Orlando to London or London to Orlando, one direction, I think Orlando one, but um, with CO2 base fuels. And so there is this opportunity to think about, you know, again, the vast majority of the CO2 capture, you're going to store it underground, but there are these really cool opportunities around carbon tech. Um, the last thing I'll mention is when you look at the companies, you actually have dozens of these companies working today. And um, I'll, I'll mention, you know, we had our entrepreneur in residence program that included mm -hmm. some of these companies um, and others that, that folks are aware of like Heirloom, 
but there is just so much really cool stuff happening. And I think it's actually the carbon tax base is a really good example of sort of how we work at Carbon 180, where um, a lot of the, the companies are really small. They're entrepreneurs. They might be, you know, they don't necessarily have lobbyists or, you know, government affairs department, but, you know, our science innovation team and others on our team are working with them really closely. And we're able to talk to them and say, you know, what are the policy barriers and how can we help make sure that the policies that are being drafted in DC are ones that are not only helpful for you know, bigger companies that have government affairs staff, um, but are also really thinking about, um, you know, enabling and supporting this, this larger, um, this larger sector. So it's really great. And um, it's, you know, also just selfishly really exciting to, you know, you spend all day talking about policy, but to go and meet the folks who are just like, building the things. Um, it's the really future. great. Yeah, you yeah, know, absolutely. I mean, I think Carbon Tech is absolutely one of those, you um, it's just almost sci-fi level of excitement kind of spaces, right? Because of course, you know, when the private sector takes ownership over, over a sector like this, really they're, they're incentivized by very different things than the government would be. Um, and one of those is to work within the constraints of our modern economy, right? So they're thinking about how can I take this what could be considered a waste stream, right? And turn it into a valuable product. And what's amazing about what they're doing is is there the that input stream um, becomes something that the more you capture and the more you utilize it, and then the more you consume it in other products, you're actually helping to solve the climate problem, right? You're actually sequestering carbon in things like building concrete um, and and even plastics one day, right? Um, so so it's a it's a really amazing kind of uh, private sector effort because there is this use case for these types of things that can really work within the current systems that we have set up globally. Um, and, and it's really exciting to see the United States government starting to support and get behind some of these smaller efforts, but that can one day be a really large part of kind of the climate uh, friendly economy. Um, and it's amazing that you guys are kind of at that forefront of enabling works for the policy front, because without that government support at, at the start, we all know about the valley of death, right? Um, you know, these, these small innovators really wouldn't be able to, to do that R&D, to, to have those, those first grants, um, to make sure that they're actually able to test and demonstrate their products and then find their market niches and, and go forward. So that's, that's really amazing work that you all are doing. No, it's really exciting. And it is funny because, you know, I mentioned that a lot of the companies, you know, maybe don't have government affair staff, but not because they don't realize the importance of policy. They're really interested to talk about policy and to talk to policymakers. And I think about companies like Opus 12 and Natasha Cave, one of the co-founders and the experience that she has, she has this like really amazing, compelling story about um, the way she was able to interact with federal R&D infrastructure and thinking through support that the Department of Energy has provided and access to equipment and things like that that have helped accelerate their success. Um, and, you know, they're getting, you know, government contracts and they're navigating that space. And so, you know, even if we're talking about this is something that the private sector is interested in, that if we're talking about one, scaling it up, two, scaling it up quickly, that uh, the innovators, for the most part, in my experience, are also recognizing, you know, federal policy is this really necessary ingredient. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, stay, take it a step back a little bit in terms of that um, enabling infrastructure. You know, we've all heard that carbon capture is expensive, um, especially when you're trying to do it not at the point source, right? So direct air capture. And and the main piece of that expense that people point to really is the energy cost. I wonder if Carbon80 has done any, any work around looking at energy costs and how we can enable um, and ensure that these future director capture systems are powered by clean energy um, that is not as expensive and can, can actually lower down those costs. Yeah, I think that's so important. And, um, you know, I, a couple of things I wanted to mention around that. Um, you know, I think there's sort of two things when policy folks at least talk about, so the non-technical experts talk about, um, you know, lowering costs. One is through sort of innovation and scale. Um, and then the other is through sort of learning by doing. And one thing that um, I, you know, I always want to share about the kind of cost around director capture is 
back in May of 2019, I think, um, there was a report from the Rodium Group called Capturing Leadership, which was a set of policy recommendations, a whole bunch of policy, really fantastic report, would strongly recommend it. They have such an amazing team. Um, but they walked through different policies. But one of the things they looked at, one of the things they looked at was just through that like learning by doing, where could direct air capture costs go, even without innovation, which is obviously super important. Um, and I want to say something like the lowest number was like $56 per ton or something. So I think that there is a really big opportunity where we're thinking about, you know, rem remembering that this is a really new and nascent industry. Mm -hmm. um, and that as we scale up, that that piece is really important. The other thing is, while we don't do sort of like really in-depth um, original research at Carbon 180, um, one thing that we are really excited about is um, at the end of 2018, some, the National Academies put out a report that had a roadmap for negative emissions technologies. And there was a lot of focus in particular on the R&D funding and kind of recommended R&D provisions for direct air capture. Mm -hmm. And this got a lot of attention on the Hill and something that we have spent a lot of time doing um, in our policy shop is to work with federal policymakers and the Department of Energy to scale up that R&D. So before 2018, 2019, there were sort of like maybe, I think our calculations are something like $11.5 million ever for director capture and federal money. And some of that went to like two or 3 million, I think was for that National Academy study. So they weren't really investing in a lot of those really important questions around energy costs and around how this is going in particular to be deployed um, and making sure that we're thinking about like renewable resources and how do we manage um, sort of the energy demands of something like direct air capture. Um, and what we've been really excited to see is a huge change in the federal investment, huge increase in federal investment where we're seeing more on the scale of 60 and then $90 million a year for negative emissions technologies. Um, and we're seeing actually even more money being invested in, in folks looking at the infrastructure package and reconciliation and the appropriations process um, and the president, you know, was in the president's budget. So, and, um, you know, I mentioned um, that uh, Dr. Suchi Chalati went over to the Department of Energy and their Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, um, which is where all of, basically all of the carbon capture, uh, carbon management research happens. Um, but that's also um, uh, uh, Dr. Jim Wilcox is over there. And this is something that she has been thinking about like more than probably any other single person. And so what we're really excited to see is actually for that federal research infrastructure, federal research agencies, the Department of Energy, the national labs to be able to invest in questions like that and to think about it, because I think this is the other thing is they're thinking about, you know, they're not working in a silo. They're thinking about this really holistically. They're working with the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. They're working with the Office of Nuclear Energy, the Office of Science. And they're seeing that like the funding is sort of spread throughout the, the Department of Energy. So they're thinking about all of those really important questions around integrated energy systems and bringing down the cost of direct air capture and what that deployment is gonna look like in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. Another amazing resource I think that, that the U.S. has and, and a number of countries have around the world, right? But but having this like really incredible national lab infrastructure where we can, you know, have organizations like yours that really focus on ensuring that Congress is appropriating funds to the right places. Those funds go to organizations like the Department of Energy that have been thinking about these things for a long time, but then they're able to disperse those funds directly to our national lab system, which is not just thinking about energy in a silo and then director capture in a silo, but has, you know, world-class researchers actually literally from all around the world who are coming together to think about these problems in a holistic manner, as well as spin out commercialization efforts, right? The national lab system, um, you know, is not like a university lab system where you have kind of the ivory tower and ideas go and they might not ever become, um, you know, companies spin out or, or whatnot. But, you know, there's a, a lot of effort specific, or especially in, in this, in this current administration to ensure that a lot of these really great innovations and these great ideas are actually given to the private sector. Um, they're supporting, you know, um, through organ even in, in the energy space, which I'm more familiar with, with organizations like GAIN, right, that supports nuclear energy and everything, yeah. um, you know, looking at having similar systems like that for integrated energy systems, specifically at INL, you know, there's a lot of great work being done there. Um, actually, I think that you probably touched on it a bit, but I'd love to kind of hear a little bit more of, of your thoughts on, you know, the, the, um, 
the executive branch side and, and the role the executive branch really can play in taking a leadership role. We've, we've been working with Congress, they're on board, it's bipartisan, thankfully, it's a really great sign, there's money being appropriated, but now it comes to, you know, how can our agency infrastructure, you know, really help to support this type of innovation work. Yeah, we're super excited about this opportunity. I'll say, you know, gain um, in my former job, I worked on much, I'm not a nuclear expert, but um, did work um, and we had Dr. Todd Allen and Susie Baker and folks on gain. And I think there's so many interesting lessons to learn from the work that they did with gain and thinking about how do you change something like the Office of Nuclear Energy where they're focused so much on large light water reactors and they're focused on you know how they might have worked decades ago and how do you change that to support a really new innovative sector like the advanced nuclear sector and i think not the exact same thing but you know i think there's a similar and something that's led by this administration a similar shift to think about what is so, so at the Department of Energy, they have the different offices, right? Office of Nuclear Energy, but they have the Office of Fossil Energy, mm-hmm. which is where, and the vast majority of that, um, that their work there is on car- point source carbon capture historically. And I actually think there's a really interesting parallel to think about because with Jen, with Suji there, and what you've seen in the administration's budget was, if you spend all of your time, like I do, digging into like old FE budgets, it was, I don't know, it was so exciting because- this administration in the president's budget laid out priorities where instead of the Office of Fossil Energy being focused on point source carbon capture exclusively, on being in particular point source carbon capture for coal, which I think the large expectations, you're not going to build a lot of right. or any point source carbon capture on coal right now, right? You're going to be focused on natural gas and most importantly, I think point source carbon capture in the industrial sector. Um that you had updates from Congress at the end of last year to the Office of Fossil Energy, but this administration stepped in and really ran with that and said, first of all, the rename that they had in there, I've been going back and forth between the Office of Fossil Energy and Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, but that was something they added. You saw really big support for, for carbon removal in there as well as in the, the Energy Act, but also you saw a shift in how they talk about carbon management technologies and they talk about them in terms of climate goals and how do you how do you make sure that the work that they're doing is is in line with those climate goals and the role that these technologies can play in meeting them and in particular again things like direct air capture and things like industrial uh, point source carbon capture. And I think that is huge. And I think that is such an important thing that this administration can do. Um, But I think there are several other things. So they just came out, CEQ came out with a really great CCUS report um, led by Jane Plagle and Sarah Forbes who have been thinking about these issues for so long. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think what you see is really across the board in this administration, people who have been thinking about the role of carbon management and climate for a long time are suddenly empowered to not just work within their sort of like agency, but really across the board. And I think that's a huge opportunity. So one is I think the Department of Energy changing how they, what their focus is and how they work on these technologies, which we're already seeing, which is again, really, really exciting. Um, We can see the White House playing this really, Um, important role of laying out a vision for carbon removal, um, of playing a coordinating function, because even though, you know, earlier in the conversation, we were saying that there are different policy needs for each piece of carbon removal, there are shared needs. And when we're talking about, you know, nationwide and international climate goals, that coordination can be really important. So thinking about how the Department of Energy works with the USDA works with the Department of Interior, works with the EPA, you know, again, going back to things like permitting for saline storage, that's something where you're going to need really robust engagement from the EPA. Um, I think that that's a really important role that, that they can play. And then I think the other thing is, you know, you also see this at the international level. So you see John Kerry talking about this. You There are efforts like Mission Innovation where the Department of Energy is coordinating with other energy research agent, agencies globally to invest in these technologies and to share learnings. And I think, you know, looking at technologies like carbon capture and direct air capture, there is such an enormous opportunity to think about what deployment globally looks like. Um, and so I think that's something else that this administration can play a really important role in. Absolutely. Again, couldn't have said it better myself. I think one of the things you you highlighted is just like we're kind of breaking down silos 
excuse me, kind of across technology spaces. We're also breaking down silos with government leaders, right? Um, we're seeing not just people in Department of Energy or even in the White House who have been empowered to think about climate across their portfolios, but even in places like Treasury and DFC, right? And that's just so incredible to see the U.S. kind of take that leadership role, especially on the world stage, by showing as an example in our own government how important we're taking this climate, um, this climate issue. No, so absolutely. I think, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think I would love to kind of hear you talk a little bit more about the future and kind of where you see Carbon 180 playing a role, maybe in the policy space, maybe in the private sector space. I'll let you take it wherever you'd like to go, but kind of where you see kind of being the most excitement for your organization and for the broader kind of carbon removal mission going forward in the next few years. Absolutely. So um, I'm I'm always defaulting to policy. That's my uh, that's my background, um, and uh, what I spend all my time thinking about. So there are a couple of things that we're excited about, in particular around policy. One is around the role that carbon removal can play, and not just um, uh, you know sort of avoiding, not just addressing emissions, but also in the context of issues like environmental justice. So my colleague Agai Kosar, who's our deputy director of policy leads our forestry and our EJ work. And so she has launched our EJ initiative. And I think it's really important for us that, again, this is something that can be a really important tool for climate, but we want to make sure it's done in a way that is equitable and just, that is helpful to frontline communities, that um, is deployed in places that want it, is deployed in ways that don't just avoid sort of repeating the harms of the past, but also redress a lot of those environmental injustices. Um, and we think that that can be that we, we think that's possible. Um, and we think it's really central both to the success of this, but also frankly, just, um, you know, it's the right thing to do. Um, and so we're really excited about that. And um, I think, you know, this is something that is not, um, to say it's not easy is, is maybe an understatement, um, but it's something where we're seeing a lot of interest in, um, you know, from, from climate advocates and thinking about this. And obviously there's been such a groundswell around Green New Deal, and I think um, Sunrise Movement, and a lot of those folks, there's so much credit to them about not just raising climate as an issue, but in how we think about climate policy, right? Is it mm -hmm. as something that is not just about, again, not just about emissions, but as something that um, can be just or unjust, right? Can be equitable or not. Um, and so we wanna make sure that the work that we're doing uh, furthers carbon removal in a just and equitable way. Um, I'll mention we are coming out with a big um, environmental justice um, report in the coming weeks. I wanna say it's coming out later this month. Um, so with some really specific um, ideas around this and some learnings from the work that we've done and we have some, some materials on our website as well. So I think that that is, fundamental to the success of this field. Um, the other thing um, that's really, another thing that's really exciting about carbon removal policy in the future, I think, is um, the role of the federal government as a customer for carbon mm -hmm. removal. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, sometimes we hear procurement in terms of uh, carbon tech and in particular building materials, which we are very excited about. And you've seen some kind of hints. There was a, an amendment from Congressman Malinowski that was introduced around uh, procurement, again, you've seen activity in the states in New York and uh, California, Hawaii, others. Um, but I think there's a bigger role the government can play not only in those sort of materials, uh, procurement of materials, but in procurement of carbon removal directly. And I think hmm. um, one of the many reasons that we're excited about this opportunity is that it also gives you the ability to think about how this is deployed. Um, and for the federal government to have a sort of stake and say in how it's deployed. So thinking about um, environmental justice, thinking about, um, you know, if you're, there was that really great Rob Meyer article in the Atlantic on solar, but thinking about how do you also build domestic supply chains, chains in the U.S. for, again, steel production, for example, mm -hmm. um, how do you support you know, uh, you know, um, strong labor standards so that these are, you know, union construction jobs and the steels produced in union factories. And you're thinking about that full chain. Um, and that, again, you're thinking about, you know, there's a, there's an opportunity to think about community engagement in this and to deploy these in, in places that want them and in ways that are helpful to communities. And if the government is a customer for this, they can think um, about that really thoroughly. I think, 
you know, I'll also mention um, back to the conversation about enabling infrastructure. I think, you know, it can be very easy for the federal government and federal policy to focus on, for example, just bringing down the cost of the technology um, because of how, how policy development advocacy works. If you are the customer for this, if you are the federal government, you're purchasing this, I think it also though gives you a different perspective on that full project development um, uh, cycle. And that you can say, oh, actually we're having trouble purchasing this or we're talking to the companies who we're purchasing from and understanding that actually the permitting process for saline storage is a huge challenge. Um, and I think we've, you know, we've been very lucky to work with Stripe and Shopify as they have done all of their amazing work in, in purchasing carbon removal and Microsoft. And um, we're really excited about the impact that that's had, but it's also just been really amazing to hear from them about their experiences and what they've learned through that. And I think has further stoked our excitement about the, the opportunity for federal procurement of carbon removal. Yeah, I, I think that's so, so critical. Essentially what, what I, I heard three kind of major things, you know, one, if we're able to, you know, focus on environmental justice aspects, you know, government being the intelligent customer of this type of this type of program, then we're also kind of able to help localize it and make it something that is desirable for local communities and something they can actually envision being something that, you know, yeah, there's the wind farm and then right next to that is the director capture plant. And I'm so proud that I live in a place that, you know, prioritizes our environment and that I'm not bringing it breathing smog. I'm, I'm actually, you know, in a place like this. I think that's, that really helps to make these projects more realistic. Another thing that helps them make, become more realistic is when you actually have that dialogue between the, the private sector um, and, and the people who are actually enabling that technology when it is still in, in a relative state of kind of infancy or not infancy, but it's still relatively new. Um, and so, you know, the earlier we can have dialogue between those two kind of sides of the coin, the, the better we'll actually be able to be at A, having a product that is, that is market fit, <laughs> um, that is right for our local needs um, and our global needs, um, but also something that can actually be deployed quickly and at scale um, because it's addressing mm -hmm. a very specific need. You know, Microsoft and, and let's say their data center need, you know, that's a very specific need that could help, um, you know, inform the way that these projects are rolled out and the way they're funded even by the federal government. And it can, of course, help to attract private fund financing. Um, so I think, you know, all of those things are just so important to already start to think about. And that's really what Carbon 180, I, I see you're doing. You're trying to kind of think about this from the roadmap perspective. Where are we at now? Where do we need to be? And what are all of the things that we need to enable in order to get us there quicker? and more efficiently. And I think that's just such incredible work. And I'm, I'm very glad that we have organizations like yours out there who are taking that, you know, that future-proof stance and really thinking smartly and strategically now and coordinating all of these disparate stakeholders to get on board and start to think about how they have a role to play in ensuring that we have a clean and equitable future um, that is not, uh, you know, disrupted by climate change. Um, no, absolutely. And it's such an exciting time. I'll mention, you know, I kind of sprinkled throughout, we had this change, we got more money, uh, you know, John Kerry's talking about carbon removal, like, this is a really exciting time to work on, on carbon removal policy. And um, you feel the the pressure of it and, and making sure that we do this really quickly and really well. But this is something where, you know, again, thinking back five, six years ago, when I met Noah, as somebody who even worked on point source carbon capture, learning from him about direct air capture and sort of making sure that it was like, okay, this is legit, um, to, you know, seeing millions and billions of dollars in federal funding going to these really important solutions that we see, you know, members in this administration. And you see on the, you know, on President-elect Biden's and transition website, you see negative emissions technologies called out. You see it in the budget, you see in the skinny budget, which is like the early, right, early document that has just like, higher priorities. And so you see all of this interest, you see all of this amazing action in the private sector and the support from companies like Stripe and Shopify and Microsoft. And you see all of this really amazing research coming out. And it's just, um, it's a really exciting time. And I think we have this opportunity now to make sure that we get it right and do it quickly. And, um, and uh, it's, you know, I think federal policy is a really important piece of that. 
Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, so much, Aaron. This has been a really amazing conversation. I certainly learned a lot. I hope that a lot of our, our audience also learns a lot about carbon removal and sees this as, you know, a really important piece of the future that I think we're all building together. So thanks again for your time. We really appreciate having you on. Thank you. Our leadership in science and industry, our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves as well as others, all require us to make this effort to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men and for the progress of all people.